welcome to 7 Investing Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding what's happening in the market now. Good afternoon, 7 Investors, and welcome to the Monday edition of 7 Investing Now. My name, of course, is Daniel Brooks Klein. I'm the host of the program. And uh, what do we do on 7 Investing Now? We look at the news of, the t- of today and put it through the lens of being long-term investors. That is really important because a lot of really short-term nonsense is going on today. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later with Steve Simonton when we hit up what's happening with Zillow. But before we do that, we're going to talk about red flags that keep you from investing in a company. Steve, I saw this weekend that you were out and about, as is usually the case. I I know you have a house and a roof, but you usually seem to be outside of it. In fact, I think your house is like twice the size of my house. Uh, (laughs) But did you see any football this weekend? Because it was a very depressing football weekend for those of us who are New England Patriots fans. Yeah, no, it was good. I I took three teenage girls to a football game. So I did a lot of explaining because my daughter is in the, she doesn't make much of an effort to understand the game, but she did. And it was fun. And it was the perfect day for football, even though our home team lost, which was sad. Yeah. I, uh, I got to watch the Patriots give away a game that they, by all accounts should have stolen because Mike McCarthy is the, he's Mike Tomlin level bad when it comes to football coaches. He, he, he (laughs) does, he'll kick it when it's 58 yards away, fourth and one but not kick it when it's 42 yards away. He'll go for it. For it. Like, it makes absolutely no sense. But that is not what we are going to talk about today. We're going to talk about red flags that keep you from investing in a company. We're each going to throw one out, and then we're going to go to some that you shared with us on Twitter. After that, we're going to talk about Zillow pausing its eye buying program. During the entire program, we would, of course, like your questions and comments. If you're watching at home, uh, feel free to say hello. Feel free to introduce yourself. Feel free to ask us a question. You can ask us about what we're talking about or really anything we will try to answer. Uh, but Steve, as we start, let me throw out a red flag for me. And it's poor customer service. And I don't mean a bad customer service experience. So uh, a few years ago, I talked a lot about I had a bad customer service experience at Walmart. Uh, but it was an outlier. It wasn't how Walmart handled customer service. It was they were pivoting to their two-day delivery and they really didn't understand how to deal with returns and broken items. And you could see it. And you're seeing that at, at a lot of retailers now where they're dealing with this weird omni-channel mix. That to me is fixable. But when right. you look at say a Comcast or a Verizon or an at and and companies that were previously monopolies and didn't have treating people well as sort of part of their company ethos, I don't actually think it's possible to switch. So for me, those are investing red flags. Now I will say T-Mobile, which was never a terrible customer service company, has actually become an incredibly good customer service company, at least on the phone. Their stores are not great. So if you're bad, you can get to okay or even good. But if you're dreadful, you might be able to get to bad. That I don't even think Comcast could get to bad if they wanted to. Steve, before we get to people's uh, comments, that we got a ton of comments on Twitter yesterday. Uh, what is one red flag that keeps you from investing in a company? I mean, the the one that pops out always right away is is fraud. You know, when companies are caught, um, and in you know, even if it takes a little time later, basically uh, strictly identified for fraud. Uh, you know, you have. Um, you know, the, the executive stepping down uh, because of fraudulent things, uh, luck and coffee, you know, comes to mind. And, and you know, it's it's hard for me uh, and, and Nicola, right, which is the, uh, <laughs> the, the the truck rolling downhill. And they said, no, we never said it had an engine. We just said it was in motion. And and, uh, you know, you had people later uh, indicted for for uh, misleading investors and scuttled GM partnership largely um, as a result. And uh, it's tough for me to step back out. Um, and and actually accept businesses that have been actually singled out for fraud like that, and uh, it, it's tough for them to earn back my trust in that process. But uh, but yeah, fraud um, is something. Yeah, that- and, and and those are outsized examples of fraud. Uh, those are both active attempts to mislead investors. Uh, Nicola, you know, you you could argue was maybe a little less egregious than actually faking the numbers, which is yeah. what happened at Luck and Coffee. Um, but usually companies don't survive that. The only sort of way uh, I would consider a company, look, if Luck and Coffee had completely new management uh, or got bought out by, I don't know, Jab Holdings or, or somebody else in the coffee space and really was a different company, well, then maybe you could look at it. Um, 
we've talked about this a lot. We talk about like why we don't often uh, issue a sell. In fact, why we've never issued a, a sell on any of our seven investing stock picks. It's because if you'd sold Luck and Coffee at the worst of the, of the scandal, you actually would have lost money because it has recovered. Not to where it was, but it actually has come up. Again, though, don't own bad companies. Uh, Doris and Renee Carell, good morning. Hello, we appreciate you watching. Um, let me get to, uh, so JT Street, our director, we had a little bit of a technical problem getting some of these comments into the system. So I don't know what comment is gonna come up. He's gonna throw them up, and Steve, you and I are going to comment. So why don't we hit the first one here, JT? Uh, this is from our very own Anirban Mahante, and he says several red slash yellow flags. Uh, and, and Steve, I'll let you take these in order. Our first is yeah. prioritizing short term over the long term. JT, you can take this down and then bring it back up. We can sort of go back and forth here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, short term focus is is a really frustrating thing. I mean, uh, not the least of which. Uh, it has to do with the fact that we are long-term investors here at Seven Investing. We think with multi-year timeframes. But you, when you have a business that is prioritizing uh, maybe short-term profits to bolster their share price or or, or make their results look better than they uh, really are, uh, it, that's a huge um, red slash yellow flag. So yes, most certainly. Yeah, and you certainly want in say an earnings call the CEO to address a short-term problem like Geesh. We had excessive ice storms in the Northeast and that meant our Northeast, but that's different than endlessly being focused on share price. And look, when, when you see sort of some of the short-term focus, I wonder if that's the executives like being like, geez, we gotta get out of this. How do we get this stock up higher? Uh, yeah. I much prefer when you have an Amazon, when you have a company where stock price in the short term is really not all that relevant. Sure, they'll explain during the pandemic, hey, we had some warehousing issues, like we had to make some pretty big shifts, but they are not going to belabor that. JT, if you want to bring it back up, we will take the second one here. Uh, and this is bankrupt leadership. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, what, what Anirban means by that, Steve. So let you take uh, this. I, I'm wondering if he means morally bankrupt leadership. <laughs> I mean, that, that could be an obvious thing. Um, yeah, I mean. Or yeah, leadership is a major factor. Uh, and certainly when you feel like leadership has no new ideas, that is definitely a problem. Let's pull it back up and keep going through this one. Uh, yeah. When demos shine, but products aren't realized. Yeah, this is absolutely a, an issue because you can make anything look good in numbers, but if I'm holding the product in my hand or using it on my screen and it stinks, that is right. really a problem. Yeah, again, Nicola kind of comes immediately to mind, right? And I think that's part of the reason their founder uh, chairman CEO was indicted for uh, securities fraud back in July uh, because he was making statements uh, that indicated that the semi behind him was a completely functional prototype. And uh, no, they just rolled it out there again. So yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. And there are ways to do that and ways not to do that. Uh, and let's go with one last comment here. Uh, tech companies that are highly dependent on software platforms run by competitors. This is one that to me is a yellow flag. It's it's not mm -hmm. a red flag because there's an awful lot of tech companies that are somewhat dependent on AWS, uh, that's Amazon Web Services, but yeah. there are alternatives. If all of a sudden Amazon shut them off, it's not that difficult to migrate to somebody else's cloud, though obviously on a large scale. Steve, what's your thought, th thoughts on this one? Yeah, uh, that's exactly the case. Uh, you know, I, I think you have to to kind of explore the nuance of that dependency and see if it's something where, you know, if this competitor's platform went away or was significantly changed uh, for the worse when it comes to maybe your, in, in, your integration or, or dependence on their platform, uh, how quickly can they pivot to something else? Uh, and are they ready to pivot to something else uh, if they're running that? So most certainly. Feel free to share some of your red flags in the chat. Depends where you're watching, whether we see them. That has been a bit of a problem uh, since Twitter killed Periscope. That's made it a little bit harder to interact with this program. JT, why don't we take the next one and keep this moving along? Uh, Diego Rivera, Rivera, Rivera Diaz says, the CEO talks about the people who short their company, especially when calling them the shorts. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and then people who follow the company regularly use the acronym FUD. Steve, do you know what that acronym stands for? I actually had to look it up, but it's, it's somewhere. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Those don't seem like a great term when it's with the company, but what's, what's your thoughts on this one? Because yeah, yeah, um, I, I agree. I don't, I don't want an executive focused on, on shorts or really sort of the stock price at all. No, uh, I, <laughs> I, 
I feel like that's also a thinly veiled criticism of Elon Musk, who literally released short shorts that people can sell for uh, as kind of a, a dig at Tesla shorts. Um, I, I'd say if it's if it's a sideshow and you're someone who's kind of a showman uh, in that sense, you know, maybe not such a big deal. But, yeah, I, I prefer CEOs that keep their head down and uh, and focus on execution. Um rather than focusing on the people who are criticizing their stock. Um, I don't mind when a CEO will, you know, will step out and personally um, re rebuke a, like maybe a, a sensationalized short report, which happens often. You get, you know, you get short sellers that release reports that are completely off base. Um, I don't mind if it's maybe like a one-time thing like that, but yeah, I, I largely prefer executives that don't do that. Addressing incorrect news is one thing. Mm -hmm. Being a Don King slash Vince McMahon like Elon Musk uh, or like even like a John Legier would have been back at T-Mobile uh, where you just take it as a personal affront and that's kind of part of the character of the company. But Tesla and T-Mobile are two companies who execute incredibly well. And that, that's the big difference, right? Is, is the executions there and, you know, I'm, full disclosure the tesla shareholder too so uh yeah definitely if the execution's there yeah. it makes it less of a big deal if you're in a company that's not pretty much perfect don't take on reddit shorts that's a that's a really bad idea in terms of just yeah. like that is an audience <clears throat> that's literally willing to lose money just to prove you wrong now tesla has has made its business on proving short sellers wrong uh, but there's very few companies who can say that we're going to take a comment from our friend Max Lucas here before we move on. And we would love more of your questions and comments. A red flag to me is when a company's vision for the future isn't something I believe in. Every publicly traded CEO is much better at business than I am, but I have to believe in the CEO's vision. Yeah, a a a absolutely. Th this even scares me sometimes at companies I really like. I've talked a lot about Steve uh, when, when the new Starbucks CEO, he's not that new anymore, but when Kevin Johnson took over from Howard Schultz at, at Starbucks, his focus was on execution and not the premium brand. And that gave me a lot of pause. Now the pandemic proved him a billion percent right <laughs> and me a billion percent wrong. And it would have been right anyway because executing better uh, sort of gets everything. And it's not like he was never gonna do what I wanted. He was just changing the timeline. Your thoughts on this one? Yeah, um, you, you do. I mean, I, I need to personally believe in in the, the vision of executive teams and yeah. Um, uh, obviously that that's a that's something that would uh, i would say prevent me from investing in the company in the first place so uh, most certainly if it's if it's something i don't believe in yeah it could be a pivot too though like if google came out or alphabet came out and said you know what boy we really are going to put a lot all of our eggs in the waymo basket and stop focusing so much on advertising oh, i would boy. go ooh, yeah. you, know, yeah. you know if disney doubled down on retail stores and dialed back its theme park and disney plus spending i'd be like oh yeah, yeah not a yeah. great idea jt let's take another one from our many many friends on twitter simon lamb says poor csr for example Facebook might be a good investment, but I don't like the contempt they have for their customers, advertisers, and lawmakers. Uh, I do own shares in Alphabet, and no, you could argue they aren't perfect either, but they do more harm than good. Uh, Steve, I don't know that I can answer this without getting in trouble, so why don't you, uh, why don't you feel this one? <laughs> and by CSR, he means corporate social responsibility, so uh, that, that's what they're talking about. And uh, yeah, Facebook's kind of been <laughs> dragged through the uh, the the coals um uh, of late for for a lot of that stuff and and yeah i'd say um in some cases it it can be a yellow flag in that you know the company is is arguing like hey we're doing everything we can right um but there is also a compelling case in other cases that uh that maybe they're not doing everything they can or um you know they're they're just completely hapless and, <laughs> and to doing a terrible job at their CSR efforts. But uh, yeah, definitely something um, to keep in mind and, and a, a public facing risk for sure. Facebook is really a challenging one because obviously at the top level, there seems to be a lack of awareness. I will say I know an awful lot of people who work at Facebook mm -hmm. and they work on very specific problems that are exactly the things we say are problems and that's their whole job. Yeah. So those people don't think of Facebook as not being a good corporate citizen. And I'm actually doing a, the 7 Investing podcast. I'm taping one tomorrow uh, on ESG investing. 
And one of my questions is how do you look at a company and go, this is real. It's something they truly believe in. Like you could look at like a Beyond Meat and be pretty sure they believe in saving the planet. But like when Amazon talks about like, you know, they build the climate pledge arena or they pay for the climate pledge arena and they sort of say all that stuff. Is it like, well, is that public relations or is that? And I guess it doesn't matter because when you have, say, like Kerrig pledge to, to get rid of K-cup waste by 2025, I guess the ocean doesn't care if it was public relations or it was, you know, or it was actually heartfelt. But yeah. to me, intent can be be really tricky. And and look, I think at Facebook, you have a CEO that perhaps doesn't experience the world the way the way all of us do. You know, he's been very wealthy for a very, a very long time. And I, I think yeah. there could be some disconnect there. Uh, but I don't think that's a simple question. Uh, let's take the question from Doris and Renee Cronell. Uh, we appreciate you all asking questions. Uh, how are all the delivery problems not affecting the bottom line on so many companies? Uh, this is actually a piece I just wrote uh, that, that'll go out, I think, on the 20th. Um, and Steve, I'll let you jump in in a second. They are and they aren't. So you're going to hear a lot about supply chain. But here's the reality. If you need a winter coat and you go to the store, they're going to have some winter coats. You might not have like all the selection you had last year, but there's going to be winter coats there. So the reality is like, if it takes four days to get something that used to take two, or even like I ordered a piece of exercise equipment and it's going to take like a month. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating for a very expensive, you know, call it Peloton like piece of equipment, but it didn't stop me from ordering it. So I think we're going to have a very extended holiday season. We're going to have some people settle, like not get the laptop they want or not get the TV they want, but if they need those things, they're going to get it. And I think like, look, a lot of kids, maybe aren't going to get quite the toys they wanted, or they're going to get like gift cards so they can buy them when they're in the, in stock. Steve, your thoughts on this one. Uh, I think it really helps in many cases that there's such strong consumer demand uh, kind of propping these things up. And, and that kind of helps uh, confidence that once these supply chain, um, you know, delivery, all these other kind of strange challenges that so many businesses are facing, chip shortages, those sorts of things um, are going to be temporary, even if they last a, a few quarters. It, it's encouraging that, um, you know, we have cash rich households and, and relatively strong consumer demand. Uh, and that kind of extends across various industries, right? Uh, you know, I, I think if you look on CNBC, uh, their homepage right now, right at the top is, is a home builder sentiment uh, article. And they're talking about how, um, you know, while, and this is something we'll talk about a little bit uh, with the Zillow section shortly here, but uh, how home builders really haven't seen any relief from supply chain issues, but um, strong demand, uh, buyer demand kind of making up for it. So they're like, Hey, we feel pretty good if we can just resolve, you know, let's get our nails uh, yeah, and, and, get and our, we'll, our lumber and yeah. We'll talk about this more when we talk about Zillow, but uh, I am somewhat in the market for a house. Like we, we, a year from December, have to move or don't have to move, but would, would probably like to not be renters and, and buy. And I've watched how they're managing construction. And the reality is they only release a, every builder. This is across like 30 different developments I've looked at. They only release a certain amount of homes each month. The ex timetable to get those homes is fairly extended. The ones you can buy ready-made are way at the top end of, of the buying chain. And if you want something that's at the lower end of the price point, you might be waiting 13 or 14 months and you might not get to pick your finishes. You might be settling for the most common. Now that said, uh, labor is more an issue here in Florida than materials because we use cinder block construction uh, and cinder blocks are not the problem. That said, lumber prices have come down. And one of the ways the builders are dealing with this because they can't have a, you know, a three bedroom home in one development cost 300 grand on December 1st and 450 grand on December 28th. So one of the ways they're managing this is they're just really spreading out their production. So if they can get X product, well, they're going to do all of X in the houses they're building. And then when they can get Y, maybe they can get roof tile, you know, the, the, the next, the next month. So it is really tricky. It is a logistics puzzle. We would love more of your questions and comments. We're going to take a couple more from Twitter. JT, if you want to throw one up. Uh, and Max Kager says 10 K full of a, complicated accounting metrics. Uh, none of the insiders own any equity and management promoting the stock instead of the product. Oh boy, I want simplicity in a 10K. <laughs> and if management, look, if management was hired, they're not gonna have a huge stake. 
But if I'm, you know, so take someone like uh, like Hubert Jolie, who is the CEO of Best Buy, and is now the executive chairman of Best Buy. I want to see that the stake he is awarded, he's holding on to eighty percent of it. I have no problem with cashing out to buy your mansion or your boat or your or you know just to have a little diversity. But if you're not holding on to most of the stock you're given, why on earth would I want to own it? Steve, your thoughts on this one? Yeah. Um... I mean, yeah, I, I can fully appreciate a 10K full of a, a complicated accounting metrics. Um, I, I think it it also, though, um, you should add the caveat that that sometimes those accounting metrics are provided to offer perspective on the progress of the business when regular gap accounting, you know, generally accepted accounting principles, accounting um, metrics don't... Um, necessarily reflect the true profitability of the business say if they're you know taking a lot of their cash flow and they're reinvesting it in um building the enterprise value of the business kind of in a, an amazon-esque way right um you know the amazons of the world that basically aren't profitable for the first 20 years of their life as a publicly traded company uh, because they've plowed so much back into growing their enterprise value and created shareholder value as a result. Uh, sometimes they'll provide, you know, things like adjusted EBITDA or, um, you know, there's a slew of other complicated accounting metrics that can kind of complicate things. But um, yeah, uh, yellow flag, I would say I'd call that. Um, insiders owning equity, obviously a plus, easier to gauge, uh, like you said, when they are part of the company from the beginning and not a hired uh, gun, I guess, somebody to come in and, and lead the company. Uh, but yes, obviously, the third point you brought up, management promoting the stock instead of the product, that's tough. And, um, you know, I, I actually appreciate the alternative, right? You have Palantir. I think it's Alex Karp uh, was stepping out and saying, nobody's forcing you to own our stock. You can go buy something else. You don't have to, you know, so it's interesting to see sort of the opposite effect. They're like, hey, you know, I don't care if you own it or not. That, hey, thumbs up. Good on you. Yeah, and it's important to remember that there are exceptions to every rule. One, we, we, we've done a lot of shows on, on Virgin Galactic. And Richard Branson, who is the, the, the founder and, and, and you know chairman, I think is his title, of Virgin Galactic, has sold a bunch of stock. But he's gotten out very publicly and said, look, I own a lot of companies in the travel space. In the, you know, yeah. I know he owns, Virgin owns the high-speed train line that's down the street from me here in West Palm Beach. It hasn't operated in 15 months uh, yeah. Though they are starting up operations, but they have been building out the ability to go from West Palm Beach to Disney World or Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach to Disney World. That is significantly expensive. So you go, oh, OK, like he sold stock, but he didn't sell stock because he doesn't believe in his company anymore. Yeah. He sold stock because he actually believes in all his companies. Like, yeah. So you do need to look for the exception. JT, if we have two more, let's take two um, more. Uh, Steve, Quick correction before we move on to Chamath is actually the chairman of Virgin Galactic. Uh, Branson is the founder, obviously, but uh, yeah, Chamath uh, Palapahatia uh, is their chairman who also owns you know 16 million shares that everybody forgets about. But uh, anyway, moving on. And, to, and he sold some too for reasons that are uh, some, personal stuff. So. Somehow, yeah, like, not as easy to follow. Uh, but let's take a couple more, JT, if you want to pull one up. Uh, if I see the CFO, and this is from Paul. The CFO, general counsel, or lead salesperson leaves suddenly within six months of joining the company. So I'll have a caveat to this, especially on the lead salesperson. You want to see where they're going. Like mm -hmm. if someone, you know, you know, and like 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 Marvin Ellison, who used to be the CEO of J.C. Penney and, and arguably was doing a good job, but your ability to save J.C. Penney was almost zero. When you get offered a bigger job, and dear God, I forget if he's Home Depot or Lowe's. I think he's the CEO of Lowe's. Uh, but when you get offered a much better job, what are you going to do? So it's sort of like if you're the, you know, the college coach at Cincinnati and LSU offers you the job, that's not a reflection of the state of Cincinnati. It's just a mm -hmm. reflection of, and I think the same thing, salespeople, and, and I will say this nicely because my brother is, is the perhaps most human uh, sales lead I, I've ever met, but most salespeople, it's money. So if you work at a company and another company offers you significant, so you really want to look at the why, not just the person leaving, but repeated turnover is generally a bad sign. Steve, your thoughts here. Yeah. And, and I think uh, the higher you go up the executive chain, the more concerning this is, uh, you know, if a CFO is brought in to help turn around the company and they leave a few months later and it's not apparent, you know, immediately evident where they're going, it, 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 
sometimes that's that's very difficult. You know, if the company's operating from a position of strength and they brought in a new CFO and it ended up not being a great fit, um, okay, you know, not as concerning, but uh, especially concerning if it's a, a struggling business that brought in a new CFO uh, who just isn't sticking around because uh, maybe they, you know, of course they will sugarcoat it when they say, you know, there's no disagreement with the company. They'll 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 try and make it sound as good as possible when they announce their resignation. Um, yeah, anybody who leaves to spend more time with their family, that's <laughs> not a good sign because that's never true. That's all. That's always a lie, uh, and it means you looked at the numbers and you didn't yeah. like them, or you've looked at the CEO's plan and you don't agree. Unless, you know, sometimes you have a, a, this guy's been CFO for 40 years, you know, and, and it's, it's time, right? But this is, yeah. Sure. 40 years, if, three years, I have no <clears throat> issue with. Yeah. If you've been someplace under a year and I see your new job and it's not obvious, it's not, you know, you're making a giant leap in, if you're, if, if it's no job, and again, there won't always be a day one disconnect. The person might leave and you might not know the new job for a few months. But if you get to three or four months and there's no new job, that is not a great sign. Now, let's take yeah. one more of these before we talk a little bit about Zillow. Uh, Renjager says, uh, dodgy reporting, such as missing clarity about customer numbers. Uh, and he's talking about Pinterest. Uh, and I'm not mm -hmm. specifically qualified to talk about that. But yeah, I am not a fan of when companies obscure numbers. And I'll give an example. Where one month or one quarter they use a certain metric, like maybe they talk about like total customers, and the next quarter they don't mention that metric at all, and they talk about like average revenue per user. And it's like, and I'm not saying you don't give more focus to the better metrics, but if you had something that was your whole earnings call previously and you don't mention it, that to me is a pretty big red flag that those numbers are not good. Yeah, um, and, and something to keep in mind here is is. Seldom does a single quarter's results, you know, make or break a, a buy thesis for any given company. But um, this also illustrates the importance of kind of keeping up with the businesses that you own, right? They, they buy and hold doesn't mean buy and ignore. Uh, you know, you've heard the phrase buy and homework, right? And uh, so you own the business, follow the results, familiarize yourself uh, with their quarterly results as they come out, and it'll help you kind of point out or at least recognize some of these places where uh, there's metrics that companies might have been kind of relying on as a show of strength. And they, you know, so they talk and maybe they're talking about dollar based net retention rates, like how much their their customers spend each subsequent year more on the company. Anything above 100 percent is positive. And then all of a sudden they stop talking about it. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Like, I, or they bury it somewhere like in, a, in an investor presentation as a footnote. And that's frustrating uh, to see and definitely red for like. Yeah. And narratives can change, especially in the weird usage patterns we've been dealing with from the pandemic. So yeah, I have right. no problem with the CEO who comes out and says, look, we told you this was the most important metric. Right now, it isn't because we're not going to acquire a lot of new customers under this, you know, under this climate. But our existing customers, wow, they're spending a lot more money because people aren't adding new. So whatever it is, you yeah. can spin it and that spin may or may not mean anything, but it has to be addressed. It has to be forthcoming. But uh, Steve, you mentioned doing your homework. Well, what do we do at 7investing? If you are a member of 7investing, of course, we give you our seven highest conviction stock picks each month. But it doesn't stop there. I don't tell you, hey, buy this company and then never mention it again. I follow that company. And when that happens, now, not when there's news, like sometimes you might just like see a news story on a company and stock goes up 2% down 2%. That doesn't really matter. But when something foundational happens, yeah. we'll tell you about it. I wrote a company update today about one of my picks. I'm going to be very vague here because we don't uh, share picks on a publicly facing show. And I wrote a little bit about the business metric, but I also wrote about my personal experience uh, using this company and interacting with people who work at this company that gave me some real insight. And I know uh, you'll do interviews with some of the executives. Sometimes they're off the record. They can't be a podcast. I know Max you know, will tour some of the facilities for some of the picks uh, you know, where he's made that we aren't just doing like your run of the mill homework. We are boots on the ground. We're talking to people in the industry. We're talking to other people who, who cover these stocks. We're going to trade shows. Si our very own Simon Erickson uh, is at a virtual Wall Street Journal tech trade show this week. We do the homework so you don't have to. So if you join 7investing, 
you get access to all our picks, but you also get access to an enormous amount of follow-up. Our, our company updates are free for members monthly call where you can ask us questions about any of our picks and, and, and we'll answer it. If we don't have an answer, we'll get you an answer later on down the road. So how do you join? You go to seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. And once you're there, you can sign up in a couple, really it's three different ways. One, you can pay us $49 a month. Uh, we're happy if you do that. But the real savings is if you pay us $399 a year. There is no other service in the investing space where you get seven world-class lead advisors putting all their efforts into one stock pick a month and keeping you up to date on their past picks. We do it very differently than anybody else. We're not all pulled into 17 different jobs. We get to focus on picking stocks and serving our members. Steve, I know you've dealt with this, where like at two in the morning, you answer someone's email. And it yeah. might not even be a stock email. It might be like a barbecue email or a pet email or, or whatever it is. Yeah. And the response you get is, oh my God, like you answered me. And it's like, yeah, of course we answer you. We answer yeah. everybody. That's what we do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had someone uh, who was having some, uh, some, they had a question about their account and it popped up at like 11 30 PM. I was like, Oh, he's in Australia. So I went down, went upstairs and answered it real quick. And he replied back right away. And I was like, Hey, that was kind of fun. You know, it's, yeah, I, uh, it I get spent, to talk to him mom, but yeah, I spent a big part of, of Saturday, uh, which, which was uh, actually my birthday, uh, chatting with, with one of our members, about a stock that I kind of famously don't like, but trying to politely sort of make my point and, and say, hey, I, I want you to win here. I want you to be right, but here's why I don't think you are. Uh, and that doesn't happen at other investing services. So we won't belabor it. The third way, of course, is if you are a student. If you're a student, you can sign up for an $84 a year annual subscription. You have to pay that all at once, but that is a tremendous value. If you're an active student and your email address doesn't register that, just shoot us an email at info at seveninvesting.com. Or if you want to gift a subscription to a student, we will absolutely help you make that happen. But Steve, we are going to move on. Mike Fee says, happy birthday, Dan. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, it's my birthday's a weird day. I, I had a, a good friend nine years ago uh, passed away on my birthday. He had cancer and, and he had a bad reaction to his first treatment. So so my birthday is a little bit melancholy. Sorry, sorry to bring the show down there. But uh, but but I appreciate the sentiment. And it was a good day for my for my my departed friend's uh, family it was parents day at, at the college where her kid is. So maybe it was, you know, a little bit difficult, but also a little bit easy, uh, a little bit easier because she was busy all day. But we're going to talk a little bit about Zillow. Steve, why don't you set the table? Tell us what happened with Zillow uh, over the weekend. I don't think this is a big deal, but the market yeah. clearly think this was a big thought. This was a big deal. Yeah, this is kind of funny because uh, Zillow has uh, its eye buying business, right? Where they buy and you know fix up if need be and sell a home, and uh, it's called Zillow Offers, where basically they'll come in, they'll make you an offer, and you can choose whether or not to accept it. And uh, so they they buy and sell, you know, hun thousands of of homes they hold on their inventory, right? And uh, so they announced um, just this morning that uh, they are pausing uh, home buying for the remainder of the year. And uh, and my first thought was, you know, this is, uh oh, like uh, is Zillow, who kind of has a, a front row seat to the housing market, are they pausing it because they see some um, harbinger of, of terrible news, right? Uh, in, in the the home market, because you know people argue the home market, my, home buying and selling market might be a little bit overheated. You're dealing with super low inventories and super high demand, and uh, and you know really really high prices on these houses uh, despite low interest rates. So that was my first fear was that uh, it was sort of a March 2020 esque pause in home buying because they were concerned about market dynamics. But no, they actually say uh, they're pausing because they are kind of dealing with a labor and supply constrained economy in a competitive real estate market. So uh, they said they basically can't hire enough people to fix up the homes and resell them uh, as quickly as they want to. So they're pausing it for the remainder of the year. One last thing, though, uh, this feels to me like um, <laughs> like you're in middle school. And it's the week before Christmas vacation and you get in trouble on the, the playground and the <laughs> teacher jokingly says you're banned from the playground for the rest of the year. And uh, it, even though you have two days left of school or something, right? So uh, it, it's they're pausing it for a month and a half. And 
big whoop, I guess, before they they kind of redo that. And and not terribly surprising given the economy that we're operating in right now. Uh, definitely no mystery that we are in a labor and supply constrained economy. And that might make it challenging for Zillow to do what it needs to do with thousands of home on its inventory. Yeah. So let me lay out how Zillow makes its money because you are a fan of this brand. I am not a fan of any of the players in this space. And let me explain why. The housing market can be volatile. We've talked about, I bought a home, I don't know, less than six months ago. I bought a vacation home for less than $150,000 that is now worth $220,000. They're selling very quickly at that price. So maybe it's yep. worth even more. That's <clears throat> maybe sustainable because of where it is in relation to other homes in the market. But mm -hmm. here in West Palm Beach, single family homes have gone from three and $400,000 to a million two. Now, if you told me a year from now they're at a million three, I would believe you. If you told me they were at 600,000, which is still significantly higher than they were a year ago, uh, I would believe you as well. So if you were Zillow, you are buying a home and you have two things to work with when it comes right. to making money. One, you're probably buying it for some percentage less than the top market value because you are, uh, you are getting, you know, giving the homeowner sort of, sort of peace of mind if they sell it. Uh, especially with values really high. Maybe they could get 450, you're offering 420, uh, but there's no hassle. You get a check, everything is easy. You don't have to do any work. You maybe want to spend 10, 15 grand more. Mm -hmm. So they make some percentage there. They make some percentage on not paying a traditional 6% real estate commission. They're, they have some costs there, but let's call it say closer to 2% than the traditional 6%. I'm making that number up because there's some cost because they do have agents and they do get paid. Uh, but they, they, they don't get the traditional commission. And then there is how efficiently can they make that home better and have it sell for more money? And yeah. that's why Zillow wasn't willing to buy the condo I sold uh, about, uh, I don't know, eight or nine months ago, because correctly, it didn't really matter how your condo was finished. Whoever bought it was going to change it. So if Zillow bought it from me for wh what I was asking, there was very little they could do. Whereas sometimes with, a, with, with certain homes, you can go, okay, this one's at 300,000, but if I redo the kitchen and put a, a, you know, update the bathrooms, now it's worth 400,000. That is where the money is for Zillow. And, mm -hmm. and to me, the fear of all of this is it's so dependent on the housing market remaining at least flat. Because if you see like a 5% downturn, you're sitting with all these houses on your books that all of a sudden look really bad. Yeah. Uh, and Steve, go ahead. I've talked way too much here. Um, I, I think the, the big, um, the big kind of asterisks that we get here, uh, is that Zillow and other iBuyers in the market have a front row seat and a massive data advantage, right? Where they know what they can and can't buy. And they know, um, the sheer economics of it on a very, very large scale. And, um, so uh, they, if there's one thing that they proved, right, the, the last time they paused home buying was kind of at the height of the pandemic in 2020. Uh, they paused it temporarily and uh, they said, you know what, there's so much uncertainty. Uh, we're not willing to kind of continue in this market until we have a, a little bit more uh, visibility in, in, over the next several months. And uh, that was a, a wise move, but it also showed how quickly they can pivot. And I think uh, if memory serves, they generally turn around the homes that they sell or that they buy and resell them within, I think it was like 56 or 58 days. Um, so on, on average, I think um, barring a massive uh, 2008, 2009 esque, um, you know, real estate market crash, uh, that I think they'll be just fine continuing to scale. And for perspective, uh, I think, uh, last quarter at the end of, uh, their, their Q2, uh, they'll be releasing Q3 results probably early November, the end of Q2, they had around 3,100 and change homes on their inventory. We are still in the very early stages of scaling this and, uh, and just seeing some of the benefits of their, their data advantage uh, over the long term. They've said they want to scale it to 15,000 homes per quarter, uh, that they'll be buying and selling. Um, so we're still really early in this and it's kind of hard to fathom. Uh, but just last year, you know, they're sitting less than 2,000 homes on inventory each quarter. So they've increased that by 50%. Uh, I think we continue to see a lot of growth in the coming years here. Yeah, and, and I think what they're doing now is semantic. There is some point at every quarter where Zillow says, we only want to own this many homes because we can only process this many homes. Yep. If there's a slight weakening in the house mar housing market and people said, you know what? I don't want to risk getting the extra 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand, whatever it is. I'm just going to sell to Zillow at some point their slate fills up. It, it It's just like on the home 
builder side, if you say, hey, we're only building 50 houses a quarter across these three developments, uh, yeah. and they sell 50 houses a quarter, but they sell them all out on the first day, and they, they do have releases, so that could happen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the next two and a half months were bad. That just means they hit their plan early on. I think that's what's happening here. Um, and I know I needed a handyman, and it was pretty difficult. Uh, even my regular handyman, uh, who is a good friend, was pretty difficult to book because the amount of work is high, and yeah. then getting yeah. the materials you need is difficult. So you know, you're going to hear supply chain, but this is hitting Zillow here. So if you like Zillow, I think this is a non-story. I think my reasons for not being a Zillow fan have nothing to do with, with this. Um, and I do say Zillow does seem to do a pretty good job at this. So... You know, for me, I just think there's too much risk, but nothing has changed about the long term of this company because they have slowed down eye buying. And there might be a little bit of on a per market basis. Hey, we're going to wait and see. Look, if I was Zillow, I wouldn't buy anything in Miami. Like Miami's like four times higher. Like you don't know how sustainable that is. Uh, but Steve, we are nearing the end of the program here. Uh, JT, this is actually held over from Friday's show, but why don't we hit our finisher uh, and wrap things up here? And it's which matters to you most when you evaluate a company you may want to buy shares in. 28% uh, said management, 26% said product, 16.2% said revenue, and 28% said upside. This is pretty evenly split. Steve, I think if you have bad management, it's pretty hard to fix any of the rest of these things. Yeah, that's that, it's it's kind of a um, tough survey because I would say it's it's a combination of all of them that I that I care about. Right, uh, I'm not going to buy a company if I believe it's massively overpriced and has very little upside. Um, by the same token, I, I would say revenue. Uh, they probably got that right. You know, the the slim um, number of people that that chose that. Uh, I, I disagree with them. Revenue is not the most important thing. Uh, product, nothing happens without a decent product. Uh, but yeah, management um, management is is tough if you have inept <laughs> management. Yeah, and no, you what, can't. go ahead. What I what I would say about revenue and product is it depends where you are in the story. Right. If you're a early stage drug developer, well, revenue is not going to be there. Uh, with product, it's where's the product going to go? And, I, and I'll give a good example. We talked about Facebook earlier. I own an original Facebook Oculus and you can see the promise in it, but it's a terrible product. It's too heavy. Uh, it gives you a headache. Like it's really hard to adjust. It's not the second generation one looks like infinitely better, but still not practical. But you can see the roadmap where Oculus will be. So if that was a standalone company, you'd look at it and go, wait, I kind of believe they're going to get there. Like that, they, that there, there's going to be an actual use for this and it's going to be like Tony Stark sunglasses uh, and it's going to work the way you want it to work. So I do think sometimes you need management to believe in because some very, you know, they don't have to be super early stage, but Amazon 10 years in, you had to believe in management uh, because the numbers did not back up what you were seeing. Now, if you interpreted them the way Jeff Bezos did, maybe you'd, you'd be positive, but that is not how most companies interpret numbers. Steve Simonton, thank you for doing this on an, a tired Monday. A lot of football uh, was watched yesterday. I ordered in barbecue. You probably barbecued. Uh, the brisket wasn't that great, but the pulled pork <laughs> w w was excellent. I, uh, Steve, I had ribs that took about nine hours, so yes, I did. <laughs> my, my goal is to learn how to cook a beef rib because it's a delicious product, uh, but it's so hard to come by. <laughs> thank you to Sam Bailey. Thank you to JT Street. Uh, thank you to all of you watching, all of you who participated. We'll be back with the Nirban Mahante on Wednesday. We're going to talk about investing internationally. That is investing in companies that are not headquartered in the US. Obviously, a Nirban is not headquartered in the US. I don't know if you know this, Steve, but he's in Australia. Really? And Australia is not a state. Um, <laughs> you know, that is an entirely different country. I know. I don't want to, you know, go too, you know, high school geography for you. Uh, but yes, a Nirban lives in a full other country. And we're going to talk about how you look at it. How do you invest in a company? where maybe you don't even understand the political environment they are operating in. How much risk is too much risk? We're going to have a lot of questions, uh, and that will be the bulk of Wednesday's show, and we might have another surprise for you on Wednesday. But until then, thank you to everyone, and we will see you Wednesday.